Um, Because today we're kind of launching into something called Advance the Kingdom. Uh, If you're new to Capstone, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. If you're watching online, so glad that you're watching. Uh, And so if you're new here for the last, whether today's your first day, I see a lot of new faces. But then also if you've been coming for the last six weeks or six months, you're you're riding a wave that we've been experiencing. And today we're kind of going to tell you where that wave has taken us uh, and where we're going to, what we believe is coming down the, uh, kind of coming down the pipe. Earlier this year in January of 2022, we, we launched into this thing called Advanced 2025 that really said, hey, for the last couple of years, because of the pandemic and because of all the things that were going on in the world, man, we kind of got, we got, got lost in the shuffle. So we said, hey, for the next three years, we want these tracks that we're going to run on. And we said uh, that we wanted to uh, multiply missionary disciples. We said that we wanted, to see, uh, we wanted to see kingdom movements happen and the understanding of what that would look like. And, and so today we want to kind of share one piece of that uh, in our vision. And and that vision is to fulfill this mission that God has given us. 2009, we started with this mission, not because we thought that we were better, that we had everything figured out as a church. It's just we said, hey, God was calling us to this little town of Fountain Inn. And the idea that God was saying, there's a lot of things that we could still do here, not because we figured church out, because we were better, but because there was something that God was adding. There was a piece of his kingdom that he wanted through this new church. I'll be honest, I didn't think it was going to work. I didn't think anybody would show up. And here we are, 14 years later looking for seats, which is really cool. But as we did that, here was our mission 14 years ago. It's simply this. It's that Capstone is authentic in who we are and relevant in what we do so that Christ can transform lives and impact a city. Uh, I failed to mention, you should have gotten the spiritual roadmap and the sermon notes are in there. So if you're like, where are our message maps? Where do we normally do that? They are in here. So for the next uh, three weeks, all your message maps, all your notes and everything are in here. Also, uh, there, uh, there are uh, weekly devotions for the next three weeks. Uh, there's also some fun little pictures and articles and quotes that will go along with Advance the Kingdom. So you're going to be seeing that. Uh, Go back, uh, write your, as I tell my T-ball team, write your name in your hat so you don't lose it, okay? Uh, And so don't, write your name here, email so you don't get it lost on Sunday morning. Or if you leave it here, because none of y'all ever leave coffee cups or Bibles here, if you leave it here, we can get it back to you. Um, And so we encourage you to take some time, maybe this afternoon or maybe tomorrow morning at coffee, uh, flip through and begin your journey with this spiritual roadmap. And that's really what we're doing is we're inviting you into a journey. And this journey, as we talk about for this next month, is really going to take us to a place of great faith. It's going to take us to a place of sacrifice and commitment. And in this invitation, we think this is your roadmap. And so there's, uh, our sermon notes are in here, but also um, the devotions are going to go with a book called Oikonomics that really deal with the gospel and economics and the understanding that Jesus's view of economics are very different than our view of economics. And so uh, we hope that you'll follow along with that. Bring this every week. Uh, you'll need that. And so during this series, we, we are really going to kind of debrief where we started with our master plan when we said, hey, if when of you guys won the billion dollar lottery and you gave us uh, you gave us 30 or 50 million dollars what would we do with this five acres what would we do and we started with the end in mind and so we said we wanted to build a community center that a church would meet at and that's kind of always been our vision to bless the city to be for the city just not in the city but our city would look at us and go man there's something different about that place there's something different and this and we that through that we get to show them and share them Jesus And so as we talked about that, this is what we're doing today and really the rest of the series is that we want to tell you what phase one looks like, give you a timetable, uh, how, what is, what's going to be a part of it and ultimately how we're going to pay for it. And so, yes, we are expanding. You kind of see now, um, just if you've rewind about two and a half years ago, uh, before the pandemic, uh, second service looked a lot like this. Um, what happened after the pandemic was it went about down to half and slowly through the faithfulness of, of we've added half of a new church in that process. But we knew even then in 2019 that there was going to have to be something that was going to be due because we were running out of space. So as we talk about what we're going to do with adding new space, that's what Advance the Kingdom is about. But when we talk about adding, adding uh, space, it's not the idea that we want to do it for ourselves, but how do we do it for our city? And, and so as we talk today about this vision, and that's today's message, is called the vision, that we want to talk about that we want to do things and dream big. And we've always done that. We've always dreamed big. We've always said we want to step out in faith. What we say here at Castellan is, is we want to do things where, where failure is certain unless God steps in. We really believe we're playing with house money. It's all his. It's all his. And so we say, God, we don't want to bury it and, and live in fear. We say, God, we want to invest it and bless your, bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So you're going to hear us say that a lot. But in this vision, 
And it's understanding of how we're going to move forward. So we're going to study, be studying on Sundays the book of Nehemiah. Some of you know the connection because Nehemiah uh, builds something. He builds a wall. And the understanding of going, well, what's the big deal about building a wall? It's the idea that it was encircling the city of Jerusalem. The holy city, David's city of Israel. And so as we talk about that, we're going to talk about the understanding that he, his desire was to restore the broken walls. That he goes to prayer and he comes out of that prayer with this burden. And in that burden, he comes out, of a, uh, he comes out with a sense of obedience. Of God, what are you telling me to do? And that's really our vision. That we want to look around in our community and go, hey, God, what is broken that we can help restore? What can we build? What can, well, through the sins and sc scars of this broken world, what can we as your church, as your hands and feet, how can we bring the gospel? How can we bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? That's why this is called to advance the kingdom. And so as we talk about that, it's not the idea to build a, a, a holy bunker uh, for four walls for us to protect us from the darkness of this world. We really believe that we've been equipped not to hide from the world, but to engage the world with the good news of, of Christ, to engage with the light of Christ. And so if you think we're just building a building for Sunday morning so we have more people for you guys to hang out, then you're wrong. You need to buckle your seatbelt because we're about to turn your world upside down, which if you're new to Capstone, you may be shocked by that. If you're old to Capstone, you know that's what we do. All right, so uh, we turn things upside down. So let's start with your first fill in the blank, which is the problem. The problem. So we're going to be looking at Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was an Israelite who was in exile. Uh, he was hanging out. Uh, and remember, he was taken into exile Israel from the book of Daniel. We remember all this good stuff. They came from uh, Israel and they came from Jerusalem uh, under the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. And we talk about the fiery furnace and all that good stuff. So he's a remnant. He's a leftover of those people. And so Israel has still been in broken pieces. So now he's, now he's a part of the, the Persian king's court because the Persians overtook uh, the Babylonians if you're, for your world history. And so now he is a part of the Persian. He serves the Persian king. All right, this is what it says in Nehemiah 1 verse 1. If you have your Bibles, we encourage you to follow along. You have your phone, go ahead and whip out your uh, app and follow along. Uh, highlight, circle, we really love God's word here and we encourage you to study it and learn from it. And so this is what it says, the words of Nehemiah, and the son of Helak. Now, it happened in the month of Kislev, in the twelfth year as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hananiah, one of the brothers, came, and certain men from Judea. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who survived the exiles, and were concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So here we see the problem. That the capital city, David's city, is now in shambles. Hananiah comes back and, and he asks, hey, hey, how's it going in Jerusalem? How's it going in rebuilding the city? Because he had heard that Ezra, which is the book before this, had, had been called to rebuild the temple. Because the built temple had been, had been destroyed. He hangs his head and says, hey man, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not looking good. There's only a few of us there, and the remnant's not doing really well. And, and ultimately, until we rebuild that wall, the city's going to be in chaos. The city's going to be in chaos. So this is the problem that we see here. Now, I, I mentioned the temple because those two things go together. Because God tells Ezra to go and to rebuild the temple. And then we're going to see that he gives this vision for Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. Now, one can seem as a, set, as a sacred place. Like, the temple was where God dwelt in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he dwells in us. But in the Old Testament, he dwells in the, the temple. So this is a key aspect of the sacredness and the holiness of the city. But then there's this wall. But the truth is, until this wall, this secular wall is built, it doesn't really have anything to do with the temple. But until it's actually built around to protect the temple, the, the, the sacred can't be fully fulfilled. So these two things go together, this secular and this sacred. Now, what we've liked to do in the American church is we've divided these two things and we get in our holy huddles and we do our little thing and, and we go do our, our sacred stuff and we don't take Jesus to the secular. Or we create our own little world over here and we forget, hey, you know what? Jesus says in Luke 19, 10, I came to seek and to save those that were lost. You know where they are at? In the secular. So one of the threads that we've been asking throughout this whole thing, and you'll see it up on the screen, this is our question. We started in 2009 and, started in, and still we asked this question in 2022. It's just not to create a sacred place for church people, but how do we equip and train sacred people with the light of Christ to go into the darkness of, the sac of, a, of a secular world? 
So we've been asking this question as we've looked at expansion is this, is what would it look like for if we could combine meeting the needs of a secular world through a secular, uh, sacred place that promoted spiritual, emotional, and physical health? What if we combine both the, se- the secular and their needs of the brokenness of this world and we said, hey, what if we created a place where these two things came together? That we sacrificed and we paid for an environment where our community to come and heal emotionally, spiritually, and physically. That's the thread that we've been asking as we've said, let's just not build a place that has cool lights and a screen and smoke and so that we can do cool worship. Our stained glass and pews and a choir law, but go, hey, what is it like for us to go? We want to build something that blesses our community and combines these two things. Going back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 7. Again, this is about the exiles being in Babylon. And Jeremiah says, hey, look, seek the welfare of the city, and there you will find your welfare. Seek the welfare of the city, secular, and there you will find your welfare in peace, sacred. The idea of going, when you bless others, then you will be blessed. Why? Because you're being the hands and feet of the Father. That you're making things right. You are bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So as we thought about designing a quote-unquote building, we're thinking, how do we bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? So there we understand the problem, and this is a unique vision. We know this isn't like most churches the way they think, but the understanding of, oh, man, God's giving you guys to think outside the box, and, and that's okay. We're weird. We're different, and, and this is where we're at. So he saw this problem, and he had a desire to seek the Lord to how to restore it. So now we're going to see this prayer. This is about six verses, uh, four through ten. I encourage you to follow along, and, and we're going we're gonna to pull some things out that are really, really good. It says this, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the Lord of the heaven. And I said, oh God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments. He says, God, you are so good. He God, you are so faithful. You keep your your commandments and you keep your covenants and you keep your faithfulness. He says, let your ear be attentive and ear and eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I pray before you day and night for for the people of Israel. If you're following along, underline that. For the people of Israel. For the people of Israel, your servants confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned against you. We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules and the commands of your servant Moses. We could fill in if we're praying for our city, if we're praying for the brokenness of our people that are saying, God, hey, we have not done what we're supposed to do. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We confess to you that we have not, our marriage has not reflected you. We can confess to you that our money has not been the best that brings you glory. We have not cared for the widow. We have not cared for the orphan. God, we confess that we have not done, we have not kept up our end of the deal. That's when Nehemiah comes, and that's what he brings before the Lord. He says, we haven't followed the law of this, your servant Moses who you told. Verse eight, remember what you told Moses or remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commands and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen them to make my name dwell there. There are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed for your great power and your strong hand. So ultimately, this is what he's saying. This is one of my big takeaways. First of all, is before he does anything, he prays. He prays. So in this prayer, we see that he has this holy discontent. He falls on his knees and there's this brokenness around him, around this city. So here's one of the questions that, that the Holy Spirit brought up in me and bring up for you guys, is how are you praying for your city? How are you praying for the broken? How are you praying for the single mom? How are you praying for that kid who, does, who can't stay awake in class because he stays up to forever because nobody's there to really watch over him? How, how are you praying for the guy who's struggling for, to, to provide for his family? How are you praying for those caught up in addiction? How are you praying for the, not your needs, not the people you love, not, but even your enemies? How are you seeking the Lord and seeking him on behalf of the city? One of the things we say here is, how are you praying for those who are close to you, but far from God? How are you praying for that neighbor who you know is far from the Lord? How are you praying for that person who's in your class or plays on that team with you? How how are you lifting them up? How are you praying? Because it says here that he falls on his knees. He says he confesses for the people that he's praying for. 
Do you confess for the brokenness of the people around you? Here we see the heart of Nehemiah for these people. He has this holy discontent. Again, that holy discontent is, is basically that to make things right or the way we define the kingdom, to make things the way God intended them to be. That's how we define the kingdom. To make things what, the way God intended them to be. So how can we bring the kingdom that he is grieved and he is burdened? For us, we are grieved that there are so many people. They are moving here by the truckloads here in Fountain Inn. The secret is out about Fountain Inn. And they are coming here. Some of you might be here today because you just moved into town or this summer you've moved here. We're so glad that you're here. But understanding there are so many people in our community who are stumbling around in the darkness with no light and no hope. And we want to be able to share the gospel with them. We're, we're grieved by the fact that, uh, that there are needs that we believe the church can help meet. We're burdened that we want to help people see the gospel, hear the gospel, and experience the gospel with ever having come into church. They don't have to come to church. So many times we think, well, we got to get them to church. we got to get them to church. Can I tell you, our job isn't to get them to a church service, it's to get them to Jesus. Some of us need to hear that because some of us are more concerned with getting them to church and getting them to a service to hear songs and to hear these scriptures. Now, that might be a part of their journey, but the journey might be coming over to your house for dinner. It might be hanging out with them on a playground. It might be just sharing a word or praying with them after a game. Whatever that might be, what does that look like in your life that you're able to see that holy discontent even there? We want to be known for what we're for, not what we're against. We as a church, too often, the, the, the people look at us and go, well, they're against this, this, and this. Go, well, let me show you what I'm, we're passionate about, what we're for, and how we want to bring the love of the Father to you. Another takeaway as Nehemiah prays is, prays is that he knows his Bible. He knows his Bible. He knows scripture. So what he's doing in verse eight is he's quoting Deuteronomy 28, 64. Write that down. You can go back and read it. But he says, hey, remember when you told Moses, <laughs> said, hey, Moses, if they ever go away from me, if they ever decide to worship themselves, not me anymore, they will be taken captive and they will be scattered. And Nehemiah is like, check. God, you were faithful. You kept your promise. You kept your promise. We screwed up. We me- Oh, I don't know. I can't say that at church. Sorry. Uh, we messed up. All right. We messed up. And we can't, we, we, we need to confess that. And you were faithful. You were faithful and you scattered us. But you know what you also say? You can write down Deuteronomy 30, one through four, because he quotes this. He says, but God, you said that if we come back to you, you will bring us back to that dwelling place. You will bring us back to the promised land. So God, I am praying. I know you were faithful because you said when we messed up that we got scattered. He says, but it says if we come back unto you, you're going to gather us back up. So I'm coming to you and praying on behalf of the people of Israel that you would gather us back up, that you would bring us back and restore Israel. Now, here's the question for you. How does scripture shape your prayer life? Are you just praying for your wants and your desires of the people that you love? Are you praying Luke 19, 10? Jesus said, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. Are, are you praying for those in the way that God might ask you to do this, something uncomfortable? We're going to be talking a lot about sacrifice and obedience. Like there might be some things that God stirs inside of you. that Holy Spirit might move in a mighty way. Are you going to go, well, I just don't really want to do that. Or man, scripture says that I'm supposed to do that. So therefore, because of the truth of scripture, I'm going to do what God's calling me to do. Nehemiah prayed his prayers based on the faithfulness and goodness of Scripture. How are, how are your prayers reflecting God's plans, commands, and instructions? How are your prayers reflecting God's plans, commands, and instructions? For us, Jesus doesn't point to a building as the end goal. So as we talk about expansion, and yes, we're going to be doubling the size of the building here at 601 Fairview Street. But ultimately, the goal isn't that we get a building. The ultimately goal is that we get better disciples. That's the goal. The idea that we're able to raise the money that we're able to do, that's great. But that's the cherry on top. Ultimately, Jesus says, well done and good and faithful servants. Not because you built a building, but because you sacrificed. Well done and good and faithful servant. Way to go. You actually listened to the Holy Spirit. Well done and good and faithful servant. You invested the resources in the kingdom. That's the goal. Not to build a place but to be a people. And that's where we see again and again and again that we would say, hey, how can you shape us to sacrifice and serve our community? That we want to create environments where friends and family can hang out. We want to create places where we see healing and a a, a place where a hub of service for schools and churches and neighborhoods and the idea of men, they can gather here. We don't want to build a place for church people to gather. We want to build a place to equip you 
but to send you. A place where you can gather other people and you can disciple other people. And you can share the gospel here at 601 Fairview Street and beyond. We will be models of Jesus by serving and sacrificing so that we can point people to Jesus. Now, it's not get them to church, just not get them to a service, but to get them to Christ. All right, so we see the problem that comes. We, we see the prayer that Nehemiah prays now. The last piece is the request. So now God's kind of planted this, this vision in his heart. Uh, he, spent, uh, he spent this time in prayer. And so now we're going to go to um, chapter 2. Now his role in the king, kingdom is that he actually is the wine taster for the king. So his job is to make sure, uh, this is pre-COVID, so he didn't worry about that. So he had to, sip, he had to swip, sip the wine, and then he would hand it to the king to make sure he didn't, you know, somebody tried to poison him. All right, so let's read. So now it says, now when he took the wine before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. So he had just taken a swig. He said, seemed to be good. So he hands it over to the king. Now I've been sad, I had not been sad in his presence because, because he kind of buried it. He kind of, he, he, this holy discontent was in him. And I don't really have time to explain it, but it's been about four months since chapter one. So about four months later, now this, this holy discontent has worked its way out. And he says, now I have not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, hey, why is your face so sad? seeing you are not sick. He says, I know you, man. He's like, you normally come in here, and I mean, you're just a bright, why? Because he's, he's a follower of, of the Father. He's the God of Israel. Like he, he, he's reflecting to a pagan king the goodness and faithfulness of the Lord. He says, normally you come in here, and, and you're, you're great, and I'm better because you're here, but today there's something wrong. He says, you're not sick. This is not but sadness from the heart. When I, uh, then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. He said, why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and his gates have been destroyed? Then the, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, please don't let him kill me. Verse five. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you would send me to Judea, the, son, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So he comes and he makes this request before the king. So the king asks, he says, hey, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's going on? And he says, hey, you know what? Again, it, remember, it's revolved around a city. He says, the city is in ruins. The city is broken. The light of my God that I worship is not Lit, send me back. If I've found every favor with you, King, please send me back and help me rebuild it. Spoiler alert, he does. This pagan king says, you know what? I like the vision. I'll help you pay for it. I'll give you leave to go do it. Let's go. We cast this vision to a pagan king and this burden that was inside of him overwhelms and, and says, you know what? Now, let's go rebuild the wall. So next week, we'll talk about the plan and how that's all going to work. But here's your big idea. So if you're new to Capstone, you haven't been here before, you're watching for the first time, we give a big idea that kind of summarizes everything. You can post on social media, have conversations at lunch, but it's just simply this. Nehemiah's vision came from a brokenness and a burden. A brokenness and a burden he had to the people of Israel. Remember how he prayed the prayer. He said, God, I'm coming on behalf of the people of Israel. It says that he mourned and he fasted and he prayed for the people of Israel to bring this secular and this sacred together, the, the temple for, for, the, for the, the spirit of the living God to dwell in. He was going to have to have this vision to rebuild the wall. Ezra was going to rebuild the temple. That wasn't his vision. His vision was to rebuild the wall and how they went together. They were one vision. Those two things work, the secular and the sacred. So that burden came, that brokenness came. So as we cast this vision, it comes from the same brokenness and burden. We want to help restore and redeem the brokenness of our city. For the lost, for the hurting, for those who are trapped in a life of materialism, for those who are trapped by an addiction or the idea that they think they can buy their way to happiness, whatever it may be, but the idea that, hey, how can we help redeem and rebuild this? For the Father, not for our glory, but for His. So what does that look like? The vision that we have. And so as we talk about that, here's what we're inviting you to. We want to invite you in on that with us. This is an invitation for you. We're not asking something from you. We're, at, we're inviting you something for you. 
that we really believe that if you join us in the spiritual, this is why it's called a spiritual roadmap. We believe in the next four weeks and you say, man, I'm all in on this. Like I'm buying into the vision. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Let's go. What are we going to do? Let's, uh, all right, we invite you because we really believe it's not going to just transform you. It's going to transform your family. It's going to transform your kids. It's going to transform your walk with Jesus. And not only that, but what we accomplish in the next month, year, three years, five years, is a spiritual legacy that will stand to be beyond us, our kids, and our grandkids. To tell the story that in 20 years, we, again, we, again we, we look back in, for September 11th in remembrance of tragedy. And in 20 years, we might look back on September 11th, 40, 42, 2042, and go, hey, remember we cast that vision? And look what God did. Because Capstone isn't big enough. We don't have enough people we don't have enough money to do the God-sized vision that God has put on our heart. Remember, this vision is big. <laughs> this vision is beautiful. This vision is expensive, but this vision is God's. So what we're gonna do uh, is Wednesday and Friday, we're gonna have an event called Community Launch and we're inviting you to do that with us. And because we're gonna be showing a lot of more images, there's about 12 uh, renderings that we have of this image and what they're gonna look like and how beautiful it's gonna be and how it's gonna transform our community and fabric. And we want you to be a part of that. We're gonna have a kid zone. We're gonna have Sunset Slush here. Uh, we're gonna have DJ here. We're gonna give free uh, gifts for everybody who comes. So we're inviting you to that. But not only that, but your neighbors and your coworkers and those you play on teams with, the idea of going, hey, this is for the community. So we want the community to get excited about this as well. So this isn't just, hey, show Capstone this cool stuff, but we're inviting the mayor, we're inviting city council, we're inviting principals, we're inviting chamber of commerce, we're inviting everybody. Say, hey, we want as the community for you guys to get excited. Also, you can just fill in the blank, anyone who's nosy, all right? <laughs> Fountain in residence page, we'll be blowing it up. What's that church building over there? I saw they're doing something. I don't know what they're doing. Um, and so the idea that if they're nosy, invite them because we say, we're glad you're nosy. We want to tell you what it is and you're going to be blessed for it. So we encourage you to invite uh, anyone you know. So Wednesday and Friday, they're both identical. Don't come to two. Just go to, or if you want to, you can. Uh, if you like, just sunset slush that much. Um, but the idea, Wednesday night or Friday night, we'd love for you to, to do that. So we're going to show you one quick image to get you excited. Uh, and so we, there, this is one image. This is looking from the current playground. So what you see there is the end of, of uh, this is Camp Rock. So you're looking at Camp Rock, and this is our parking lot. So basically all of our parking will get shifted and moved. Apparently you can't build under power lines. They frown upon such. So we're going to move the parking lot under the uh, thing. So this is what we're talking about. Half an acre of green space, a community playground, a gymnasium to partner with the city to be able to have recreation, that we're going to have these lobbies, that we're going to have a uh, community meeting space, that we're going to have uh, some new offices for our leadership and, and stuff. And so lots of new things that we're going to be telling you about. And so the idea is that, yes, we are going to build this. You're like, oh, you're right. Uh, that's what Nehemiah thought. God, there's no way I could ever rebuild the wall. And he said, yeah, right. And God said, if you're obedient, I'll do it. And that's where we're at. If we really believe, if we think that we're obedient, that we feel like God can and will do this. Again, this is his vision, not ours. This is his church, not ours. And he is still good and he is still God whether we build it in the next three years, which we pray would be, or the next five years, we don't really know. But the idea that we want to build this and bless this for our city. So just go back up to that uh, calendar, Baron. Uh, so we have that. And so for the next couple of Sundays, we'll be also continuing our Nehemiah study. During the week, you guys are going to be in this book and you're going to be doing the o economic study about finances and what that looks like and, and resources. We're going to have a night of worship on Friday night before our commitment Sunday. So we're gonna have a night of worship of prayer and just song and the idea of going, man, we just really wanna allow the Holy Spirit to move in all of us, in our families, sit down with your kids, explain what's going on. And the idea of going, man, we wanna to begin to go, how can we commit for the next 36 months to invest in our community like no one has ever invested in a long, long time in Fountain Inn? Not for our gain, not that we're gonna make a ton of money, or that, but that we give it away so that our community can be better because of it. We can be that Matthew 5, Sedona Hill.
So we're going to do that night of worship. And then 25th is going to be our Commitment Sunday. You'll be hearing more about that. And then October 2nd is our Fall Fam Jam. And so the idea that we're going to be one service out in the parking lot. We're going to outline the, where the gym is actually going to be. Which Our plan is to move worship into the gym because uh, we're outgrowing the space. As you guys can already see that in second service. We're going to be moving all of our worship over there whenever we're able to build. And so the idea that man, we're going we're gonna to model that. And we're going to have hay rides and carnival rides. And we're just going to have a great time of celebration. And we're going to reveal how much we were able to raise for the next 36 months. Now, here's the deal. Well, we'll, we'll tell you what that number is later. I think we're going to tell you next, actually during the community launch and all that good stuff. If not, you'll hear. But we're going to try to raise some, a lot of money, a lot of money. And so the idea of going, hey, we're going to reveal that. And here's the thing. We're celebrating whether that number, we hit the number or we don't. Because you know why? Because ultimately during the next four weeks, you're better disciples because of what we're experiencing. That's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating what God can and will do through us who are just simply obedient. And that's where we want to leave you, that, hey, anyone can do this. And so we really believe these spiritual romance are going to help you. And what I've learned over the last 30 years of following Jesus is this. It's, it's not about having everything figured out. It's the courage to take steps of faith. Faith is, isn't based on what we have, but it's the vision that's been placed before us. Well, we have the courage as a church, but ultimately as families on mission together, well, we have the courage to go where God has called us, this vision that he's placed before us. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now full of thanks. The God that we see the faithfulness of Nehemiah and what he does with this vision, this burden, this, this problem that ultimately leads to a prayer, that prayer that leads to this holy discontent, that holy discontent that ultimately leads to this request and that a pagan king says, hey, I'll pay for it. You've had the courage. You've dwelt over this. You have, you have uh, it has literally physically, physically affected you, Nehemiah. He said, because of your faithfulness, I will build it. And so Lord, I pray that this is, like we said, this is a, a God-sized vision. This is a, a faith-filled uh, endeavor that we are, we are calling to invest in the kingdom. But Lord, it's yours. And so we know that we just want to be obedient in that. And so we give that to you. I thank you for those who are here today and who are watching I pray there's someone who doesn't know you today. They're hearing the truth of the gospel. That God, it's not about us getting something from you. But God, it is what we can give to you. The idea that we give all of ourselves because of what Christ has done for us. That we would give all of ourselves, heart, soul, mind, and body for your glory in order to bring your kingdom on earth as in heaven. We thank you for this time and we continue in worship. Amen.